Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Regina Ajia, welcoming you this morning to the Garden State Initiative's fifth virtual policy forum. So thanks for being with us today. And consistent with our uh, nonpartisan approach at the Garden State Initiative, this morning, we're gonna have a really robust discussion with a variety of uh, points of view. And you know what we always try to do is help inform decisions, not prescribe them, and just really talk about consequences of different decisions. So I think you're gonna hear a lot of that uh, this morning. So looking forward to having it. A little bit different for this forum versus the others. Uh, we have a moderator who um, is not a member of the GSI team, but a good friend. And Tom Bergeron, who is the editor of ROINJ, I am uh, entrusting the GSI brand too for 90 minutes, and uh, he'll be moderating the discussion. He'll, uh, I'm going to turn it over to him, and he'll explain the, uh, introduce the panelists, I should say, and then explain how we'll go forward. So, uh, looking forward to it. And Tom, thanks a lot. Regina, thanks for the introduction. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Tom Bergeron. I'm not the host of Dancing with the Stars. I run ROINJ, which I hope you guys are all familiar with as a uh, leading publication and website for business and government news. Um, happy to do it here. This is a topic that we cover closely. Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to introduce each of the panelists, allow them to give a, a short introduction of what they're doing I've got a whole list of questions here that I can do, but for those who are familiar with ROI events and webinars, we always encourage a lot of uh, questions from the, from the crowd. The chat box is open. Uh, if you're here and you have thoughts, share them and, and we'll talk to uh, what's a pretty good panel of panelists, a cast of panelists here. So let's go through uh, the list. I'll go through them as I have them in alphabetical order. John Boyd, give us the 30 second background. Well, Tom, it's great to be with you this morning. My name is John Boyd, principal with The Boyd Company. We're based in Princeton, New Jersey. We counsel major U.S. and overseas corporations where to locate their facilities throughout North America. Clients of ours include Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, J.P. Morgan Chase, TD Bank, PNC Bank, GlaxoSmithKline, and many other Fortune 500 companies. We also counsel some of the nation's largest private developers where to do new projects, both commercial, mixed-use, and industrial projects. So I look forward to sharing my insights with you on business climate trends uh, during this very exciting time in the world of economic development. Uh, businesses and people are more mobile than ever, ever before. All right, so I'll go ahead and say what everybody's thinking right now. John has already run the best dressed award and the best background award. So pretty much hats off to them. Uh, Assemblyman <laughs> Cicelli, you're going to have to try to top that. Let's kick it to you. Uh, give us your 30 second uh, intro. Well, good morning to everyone. Happy to be with the group, and I see a number of familiar faces. Good morning, Sal. Just looking across the board. Good morning, Anthony. Um, I serve in the third legislative district. I'm in the General Assembly, completing almost 22 years, which is a lot of time suddenly. Um, I serve as vice chairman of budget, uh, chairman of appropriations, and also serve as a deputy speaker as part of Craig Coughlin's leadership group. So I get to be on the inside on a lot of things. And over the years, I've been very engaged in issues of taxation related to business and uh, changes that we thought were helpful, which we'll talk about as we go. So, uh, you know, I'm very, very optimistic about New Jersey. Otherwise, I wouldn't live here. And as further background, I am a business person, a small business person operating Hill Studios, scenic Fallsburg, New Jersey. We're in the motion picture facility rental business on a very small scale. So uh, I, I'm in real time in business and a part-time legislator. So looking forward to the discussion and um, see what the takeaway is. All right, thank you. Next up is Joe Colangelo. Readers of ROI know that we enjoyed writing about his, uh, his innovative and entrepreneurial company, which has run into COVID uh, head on. We love the kind of stuff that he does. We love the type of vision that he brings and the entrepreneurship that the state needs. So with that in mind, Joe, give us a 30 second elevator pitch. Hey, uh, it's really great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as Tom said, I'm a small business owner, a startup. We've raised uh, $2 million in the last four years. Uh, our principal business is letting people rent out their parking spots. And that was primarily near um, train stations where it was really hard to park. So we would generate extra revenue for a church, kind of like Airbnb. Um, we would get, you know, 25% of the revenue. So we had a business that we could grow and hire employees for. And we would give people a reserved parking spot in about 35 towns throughout New Jersey. Uh, and then it, you know, all across the country as well. 
Um, so yeah, we went from a thousand reservations a day down to uh, zero. And, you know, we make cruise lines look good, honestly, the way that we've rebounded or, or haven't. Um, so in the last year, we did drive-in movies, groceries, um, you know, uh, Zoom comedy shows, you name it. Basically, like we've been doing everything, mobile car detailing, uh, and we continue to integrate more service providers. And, you know, we're going to try to get people back to commuting with our private bus service and our parking when they do come back. But in the meantime, we're looking to leverage our, uh, you know, our app to help small business owners that might not have really great technology or, or their own app to, you know, better and more seamlessly sell their services uh, to our existing 25,000 New Jersey customers. So I don't mean to date myself with a V8 reference, but but Joe's the type of guy when we do stories on where you just sit there and say, man, why didn't I think of that? That's a great idea. Uh, and we're confident when we come back, we'll be back. Now, here's the part that I always got to bring up every panel. You got to have a lawyer, right? You got to have a lawyer in the thing. So we've got a good one. Jeremy Farrell, nice mix of, of being a lawyer, of being a government uh, employee in service, a lot with real estate development and all of that. Uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, give us your elevator pitch. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, you know, as Tom suggests, I was a, and am a lawyer. I was, I'm the former general counsel for Jersey City, which is how I found my way into development at all. I was a litigator, uh, helping companies sue each other and, and making a buck on the side of that. But uh, when I went to Jersey City, it turned out I happened upon the fastest growing city in the state and had to figure out development very quick. And from that time there, I found my way to the Lafrax and now I'm their uh, national head of government and community affairs, but also having, you know, LaFrac being a closely held family or uh, business, you wear many hats. And now I also oversee the development of our Newport site, which is in Jersey City on the waterfront. And I'm president of the uh, Property Owners Association there and the development corporation there. And in that, you know, we have some 6,000 residents and a couple million square feet of commercial and retail, all of which is desperately hanging on all the great ideas that we're gonna come up with today so we can continue to grow our business. So there's the first breaking news takeaway. Uh, Jersey City, apparently good for business and business growth. Who would have thought? <laughs> Jeremy, glad to have you there. Let's go to the other end of the state. My friend, Christina Renna, uh, she does everything with, with arguably the best regional, cha regional chamber in the state. It's really a statewide chamber. Um, of South Jersey. Regina, give us, uh, not Regina, Christina, give us your 30 second elevator pitch of what you guys are doing down there and, and how you're helping South Jersey grow. Sure, thanks Tom and good morning everyone. Um, my name is Christina Renna. I am president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce Southern New Jersey. As Tom alluded to, we represent businesses of all shapes and sizes from Burlington County down to Cape May County but we really consider ourselves a statewide organization. Uh, we have businesses from all over the state and really all over the country, uh, California, Washington State, Texas, Florida, of course, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York. So we really run the gamut as far as understanding and following all of the issues that impact the business community, not just here in South Jersey, but across the spectrum in the state. Um, we have about 1,100 members. About 80 of them are categorized as small business, which we say is 50 employees or less. But we also have many of the heavy hitters in the state and almost all of the heavy hitters in the South, including all of the casinos, um, all of the institutions of higher education, all of the major hospital systems, all the major utility companies and the like. So very happy to be here. Thank you to Regina and GSI for the invitation and looking forward to the conversation. All right, Christina, let's start with you. The, the, the topic of our discussion is New Jersey business climate. What will it take for New Jersey to win? And, and we'll skip over the Atlantic City, the Atlantic City gambling aspect of that. Um, and let's talk about growth industries in the state. I think one in the last month and the last two months that's really come up is the offshore wind industry. There's a lot going on down in South Jersey. Why don't you talk a little bit about that, bring people up to date on, on what this could mean for the economy, not just in South Jersey, but but the whole state and the whole region and the whole East Coast, if, if people have their way. 
Yeah, no, New Jersey and specifically here in South Jersey, we have the ability to be the hub of all wind energy development in the Northeast, which is really exciting. And I'll let the assemblyman, because I think we're going to kick it over to him as well, talk a little bit more about what's happening in his backyard at the Port of Paulsboro. But again, um, with the wind farm that's going up 15 miles off the coast of Atlantic City and some of the wind manufacturing coming to the South Jersey area in Assemblyman Berzicelli's backyard, really exciting time for not just um, job growth, but these are, the, these are really high-end um, jobs that are going to be long-lasting assuming, of course, that this industry ends up being a reliable one, which by all intents and purposes certainly seems as though it is. So wind energy is certainly top of mind right now as far as growing industries are concerned. But we're blessed here in South Jersey that you know, one of the benefits being in this area of the state is that there's actually room to grow in this area of the state, unlike other areas of the state. We have land, we have space, um, and we have for New Jersey, you know, lower property taxes. So we're also seeing different industries pop up. Aviation in Atlanta County specifically, drone development and some really interesting drone tech things happening in Cape May County. And then of course, things like cannabis and the hash industries that are gonna really benefit the entire state, but especially certain areas of South Jersey because of our rural areas down here. So that's a little bit of a snapshot. Um, I'm gonna let the assemblyman talk a little bit more about wind because that's really his bread and butter. But you know, there's a snapshot of really some budding industries in New Jersey that although maybe a little bit South Jersey centric are gonna impact widely on the job opportunities and of course overall econ and economic development in the state. Assemblyman, we'll kick it to you. There we go. Sorry about that. We're struggling with with the, with the technology again. Good morning to everyone. Christina sort of set the uh, set the table on the wind stuff, and I don't I don't want to beat that necessarily to death. But you know the you know the state made a decision collectively, uh, legislatively. Governor Christie signed the original bill. Uh, the wind industry stalled a bit uh, for a number of reasons, but that 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 is now behind us, and it it, it is honestly coming to life. States has awarded one development field to Orsted, the uh, Davies Stone Company, uh, and uh, and are about to uh, be used to make a on a second field. And there was an announcement for the uh, steel manufacturing facility that will build the monopiles to be built at the Paulsburg Port. Governor uh, Governor Murphy's included two hundred million dollars in this year's extraordinary budget. When I say extraordinary because it's it's a big budget, but two hundred million dollars towards the new port facility in Salem County which will join the nuclear facility and that'll become a logistics facility. Uh, and we're hoping to attract uh, some additional manufacturing there, including the turbines and some other, uh, other components that we'd like to have made in America. So, uh, you know, the state's all in on this uh, and uh, it's critical that many of us keep our eye on the ball because wind electricity is gonna be subsidized. It's not going to be cheap. There's a lot of benefits to it, but at the same point, the state and ratepayers are going to subsidize it. So part of the benefit of the bargain is we had to have on land jobs, which meant the supply chain. And it's written into the legislation for these people developing the fields off of New Jersey that they've got to do these things. Uh, but for this to have a long life, that means we have to do it first. So that way other facilities don't get built that will serve New York, Massachusetts, Virginia. And we're on, we're on course to do that. So, uh, you know, that's part of that dimension. And I, I, I know, uh, Tom, you mentioned not necessarily to dwell in Atlantic City, but, you know, looking back, and I consider it to be a success for the state, the fact that we're able to bring online gambling in place in, in a safe way, uh, bring sports gaming in place in a safe way during this difficult time, that's held things together. And again, this year, the state, uh, New Jersey, surpassed in revenue gambled uh, Nevada at the Super Bowl. Of course, keep in mind, that's because our colleagues in New York can't get their act together. So we have a spill off from the New York region into New Jersey, which is to our benefit. And uh, we kept the tax rate low so we compete better in odds with our neighbors in Pennsylvania. Those things sometimes can make a difference. So, um, you know, the Atlantic City stuff still plays a role for us. 
And, uh, you know, there, there's a great deal of talk about, you know, the topic of this is how do we make New Jersey competitive? And, you know, it, it, we have a double-edged sword. Our location still is our, still is our best calling card. So much of the nation's population sits within a two, three-hour drive of us. But this is an expensive place to do business. The Northeast states are tough because, you know, we have legacy issues. We've been around a long time. You know, it's easy to plow up unused farmland in South Carolina and say we're starting fresh. As Christina said, we don't have that luxury here. And we have great legacy issues that, 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 are, that, are, that are a burden in, in our state apparatus. So, you know, how do we attract business? Look, New York's having the same problem, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Massachusetts, all same issues that we have because we are old legacy states. So how do we crack this code? Uh, we're open to all suggestions. And by the way, if it were easy, it would have been done. Remember, you know, we've been through, Christie administration was aggressive on business, got us probably from being last in the state for business climate. I think we may have climbed as high as 46 at some point, um, but you know, and that wasn't, and that was a great effort. So uh, there's a lot of people on this, on this conference that have a lot of experience um, in working in these, in this, in this area. So uh, we're always looking for answers because we're not doing as well as we can. We have a lot to sell. You know, we're trying hard. The new incentive package is together. There's a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. The gentleman spoke earlier that John Boyd, who got, of course, the recognition for both appearance and background uh, to set the tone for today. Uh, you know, the new incentive program is real. I think it's well constructed, by the way, with a range to get from Main Street to out, out of the state for people that we want to try to attract in. So, um, you know, and by the way, you know, those places look real good. You know, Texas looks real good a lot of times until it gets cold and you need electricity. So, you know, so, you know, the grass may be, may appear greener on the other side, but in the end, it's still grass. So I think for our purposes, we got to stay focused and figure out what it is we can do. And the first position is retain what we have. And the second position is attract new. So um, I, I know I was a little bit long-winded. And uh, so Tom, let me turn it back to you. And No, no, uh, look, I'm going to, I'm going to go to a gambling reference. If you had New York bashing, the over-under was 15 minutes. So we got the under there. So we're good there. If you parlayed it with Texas and South Carolina, we're, we're all good with that. Um, no, listen, I, I love your thoughts. I love the idea of what we have and what we want to build. That's why we've got John Boyd on the call. Um, he's the type of guy who's working with companies coming in, coming out, who sees what, uh, the legislature is putting up with and, and trying to put out there to see if it works. John, what's the attractiveness of New Jersey that you're seeing with companies in the process right now? Well, look, New Jersey enjoy it. First of all, I want to uh, give kudos to Christina and the assemblymen for their leadership with offshore wind uh, and with online game gaming, which has so much potential to create jobs and in emerging industries like animation and film production uh, and, and digital media. And I can give some analogies to what other states are doing on that front. But, but New Jersey enjoys a critical mass of colleges and universities. Some of the nation's most premier intellectual capital still calls New Jersey home at least, uh, you know, nine months of the year they, they do. Uh, and great transportation assets. Uh, New Jersey enjoys a great link to the global marketplace via deep water ports access to major gateway international airports. We have a great mix of suburban places to live, as well as urban areas that provide a social impact platform for companies. Um, so New Jersey has much to offer companies, but as the assemblyman said, uh, economic development is very difficult. We call it the second war between the states. That's how competitive economic development is today. New Jersey is a very expensive place to do business. And there's a common denominator among states attracting corporate investment and jobs today. States like Florida, Texas, the Carolinas. These are states that hold the line on taxes, hold the line on regulations, and operate with fiscal discipline. And we see New Jersey, unfortunately, uh, continuing this game plan of more borrowing, more taxing, and more, and more spending. That's led to a historic outmigration of people, wealth, and business, even prior to COVID. And COVID has clearly accelerated that trend to the degree where we're going to lose representation in Washington. And of course, that has implications upon where federal dollars are spent. Um, but there are things New Jersey can do. Uh, and it all starts with leadership, proactive leadership from the governor's office down to the county and regional level. And you know, one thought about former Governor Christie, one of the smartest things he did early in his first term 
was he staffed Choose New Jersey with the best and most highly regarded economic development professionals in, in the nation. He hired Tracy McDaniels and Michael Kobrick from Texas. They're winners. They know what it's like to win at, at the game of economic development. And what, what that did, it sent a message to the business community that New Jersey is open for business, that will listen to the concerns of the private sector, will want to partner with you uh, to create a vibrant economy. We saw trophy projects like Panasonic and Subaru and the- So, so John, let me cut you off real quick because we got our first question of the day, which is great. Um, if a company calls you today, right, we get off this call and they say, hey, we're looking at New Jersey, we're looking at New York, we're looking at Texas, we're looking at Nashville. Give us the pitch for New Jersey. What's your argument? And, and truth be told, is it number one on your list of what you're pitching? No, no it's not. I mean, you know, uh, quite frankly, there are, and we've been very active in New Jersey over the years, there is a, an enormous concern about the direction the state is headed. And I, I mentioned the, the signal to, to, to that New Jersey gave several years ago that we're trying to get the ship back on the right course. That's not the message companies are getting today. I think the millionaire's tax, for example, happened at the absolute worst time. It's tone deaf policy. Even Connecticut, uh, Ned Lamont, ultra progressive, refused to raise taxes during this period. So there are challenges, but it's about leadership, okay? Uh, but again, if you're asking me to sell New Jersey, I sell obviously the transportation assets, the intellectual capital, the cost savings versus Manhattan. Uh, there are significant cost savings in Jersey City and in Newark for major Class A office projects. Uh, I don't want to jump the gun and give you what my lightning round answer is, is going to be, but <laughs> we, we perceive very exciting things happening across the Hudson from New York and Jersey City and Newark over the next 18 months. Uh, I, I also sell this idea of social impact. New Jersey offers a premier opportunity for companies to make equitable pro uh, difference in the lives of people sustainability and diversity uh, and, and some of the other uh, some of the other issues all right so and you incentives, okay incentives i give the assembly credit for his leadership with the incentive bill we needed that incentive bill it was the right bill for the right time and that will help underwrite a lot of costs for companies that want to do business in the garden state you, you couldn't have set up jeremy any better i mean let's talk about the idea of new jersey being an expensive place to work and and, and create a business unless you compare it to new york city where jersey actually gets a a benefit. Uh, Jeremy spent a lot of time in Jersey City, as he said, and, and Mayor Fulop is, I think, a poster child for both business growth and social equity growth. I mean, the, the things that he's been able to accomplish there are great. So, Jeremy, let's let's bring it up to the northern end of the state and the areas that you work in and talk about how you see the business climate. Is it growing? Can we take advantage of this exodus from New York companies? Or are they just going to pass right over us and go to Nashville? Um, Tell me what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and what you're pitching. Well, I, you know, I couldn't agree with the panel more as to New Jersey's assets and then the hurdles. You know, what we're seeing is people do, in fact, want to do business in New Jersey. But what that does is that gets us looks, you know, and we have uh, a few million square feet that we're constantly turning over and trying to do deals on. And people come and look, and then they say, yeah, but I can get a better deal elsewhere. And, you know, we, could, we definitely needed that incentive bill because we saw in that period where we had nothing to offer, that was that wor our worst period to try and do a deal. But what we do have to offer, you know, is the ability to bring that talent pool that John talked about while still having proximity that the assemblyman talked about to a marketplace that has a relatively high quality of life. And that's Jersey's real complexity. That's the real issue we have to resolve because as the assemblyman correctly pointed out, we have legacy issues, but it's those very legacy issues that can really provide that final uh, exclamation point on a package on a deal for New Jersey. And that, that comes with you know, a decent quality of life, infrastructure, access to talent. But the question is how do you pay for all of that without taxing so highly that you create a, an impossible barrier to, to to jump over. What we're seeing is particularly uh, back of house uh, data is very attractive in New Jersey. And, and that's because it needs that infrastructure to really survive. We're also seeing people, uh, you know, deals coming from startups, tech based that need proximity and need a certain uh, income level to support their business as a user. You know, and that's why, you know, going back to online gaming 
that was a huge opportunity for places like Jersey City, where we started picking up smaller tech operations that had platforms selling in that space. Um, but the real opportunity that we've noticed, or the biggest opportunity that we noticed, has been in um, biomedicine research, please, which is not something we expected. Uh, and that is, again, going back to that human capital, those, uh, those universities, those huge amounts of young talent that is available to support those operations. All right, listen, I, I got to give a tip of the hat to Regina and Bill here because you've given me the perfect panel and the panel is just setting me up. This is the easiest moderating job I've ever had. I'm going to go to my friend Joe now because we talk about the big companies and the Panasonics and attracting them to the state, but Governor Murphy and others have made a big point about how we need the small business, we need the entrepreneurs, we need the next huge businesses coming in. Here's Joe who did something incredibly tech-based, the type of thing that the state wants more of. Talk about your experiences of growing and trying to build your business as a small business owner in New Jersey. You know, what were the pros and cons? What were the opportunities and challenges? Did you feel like you were welcome for your idea to, to jump in and get going here? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. I knew what I was getting into. You know, I was born and raised in Cranford, New Jersey, uh, spent eight years in California, uh, Berkeley College and Navy and then D.C., and I chose to come back to Cranford. You know, I've got five kids myself and uh, we've got good schools to, you know, some of the best schools in the nation. Uh, I was well aware of the property taxes I was getting into um, and all the headwinds, right? But New Jersey's got all these great assets, already mentioned the deep water ports, the connectivity to New York. Um, you know, we've got beaches, we've got uh, farmland, we've got all, all, this, all this wonderful, you know, natural resources. Um, you know, and, and our business since revolutionary days, right? Ben Franklin called us a beer keg tapped at both ends between Philly and New York. Uh, like our business has always been basically, uh, you know, get a little slice. Why isn't of that the on the sign when you come into the state, right? I think that would, yeah. <laughs> that would take back some business. <laughs> our, our, you know, our state's business has always been getting stuff, getting a small slice of the business that goes to and from New York City, essentially, um, you know, and, and hoping to get people to move out of there who can't afford it or don't want to live there anymore. Um, and, and then eventually pharma a couple hundred years later. But, um, you know, when we look at like where we're going now, um, I'm just a small business owner, right? Like this is a, uh, a panel of esteemed people who understand a lot more about regulations and, and tax rates and everything than I do. You know, when you think about like what New Jersey needs to do to get competitive, um, right? It's not hard, right? We, we, would, uh, we would lower taxes, we would get rid of regulations that are burdensome on companies. Uh, we would, you know, maybe take a harder line on institutionalized corruption, uh, more statewide elected official, like, like lower, lower taxes and, and businesses will move here, right? We could lower the tax rate uh, for corporations, get rid of the EDA um, and net out positively with a lower tax rate and people would move their corporations here. But again, I'm just a small businessman. Like, you know, I'm not the expert. I'm, I'm one of the blind men groping the elephant and everybody else has a bigger picture. So it seems to me, just from my small businessman perspective and my parental perspective, trying to raise kids in the state, like we are just not prioritizing this because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if we lower taxes and get rid of some regulations, um, you know, more businesses will move here and more startups will want to grow here. Um, there has been a lot of lip service to your point about you know, more technology, um, you know, spurring startup investment, you can get grants. We're going to start our own fund um, in New Jersey, similar to the one that they did down in um, Virginia. And I guess, you know, um, maybe, you know, it, do we really think that government with a scalpel is going to sort of like be a, you know, this artist that carves out, um, you know, the, the best path forward to incentivize businesses? Or is it just going to work if we say, yep, it's a good tax environment and, you know, we've got these, uh, like a very dense state of very wealthy people, good schools and fine transportation. Again, I'm not the expert in this, but from a small business perspective, I would much rather see a lower tax rate predictability, you know, less harsh lockdowns, uh, revoking emergency power so that, you know, somebody can't wake up and say, well, I don't want bakeries to open tomorrow um, and have that be so. And, you know, uh, I, I just want predictability. Give me some predictability and I'll choose whether and how much to invest in New Jersey. All right, I'm gonna kick it back to one of our experts, Christina, down in South Jersey. And, and, and what I like about you, Christina, bringing in here is you're dealing with small, medium and large companies. 
You're dealing with big, bad Philadelphia, which is nothing like New York. You're also dealing with Delaware, which we just sort of brush off. But down there, I mean, that, that's a real concern, too, trying to, to battle that. Talk about starting a business and what the state could do better to bring more to the South Jersey region, what you're hearing from your members and, and where you think that this should go. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, starting a business in New Jersey it is, is like starting a business everywhere else. It's, it's obviously a big undertaking, but a much bigger undertaking given the circumstances we're faced with here in New Jersey. Business attraction is always very hard because of all the things you just heard from the rest of the panel. Our high tax rate, the ability crisis that we're all dealing with. You know, we need to look at how we improve it longer term. And a lot of suggestions have already been made by the panel. Um, you know, and if you're looking to create a business in New Jersey, especially here in South Jersey, it's impossible not to look at Delaware and and Pennsylvania for us down here that have considerably lower tax rates across the board. And so um, I just recently had a me member looking to relocate to another area in South Jersey and decided to go into Northern Delaware. These are real stories that happen all the time because at the end of the day of our high tax rate and cost of living. But in addition to that, we have the things we've been complaining about globally in the business community for years. We have a very complex regulatory system here in New Jersey that can, you know, convolutes our federal regulations with state regulations, with county regulations, with local municipal regulations that make starting a business very confusing. Um, and you have business owners that are going in and kind of taking a leap of faith. They need that predictability we just heard about. They need that consistency we just heard about. Um, it's incredibly important if we want to have businesses anywhere in the state choose to start, choose to start here in New Jersey and then see success. Um, additionally, and this was touched on earlier as well by several folks, it is going to be critical for government to be seen as a partner and not an adversary. And for better, for worse, that is something that we saw during the eight years of Governor Christie's administration. Businesses that were looking to open, small, medium, or large, didn't see government as someone that was going to be working against them or potentially um, proposing new policies or regulations that were going to hinder their success. And unfortunately now, we've seen a little bit of a shift in that. Government is not necessarily seen as a partner for business, which makes business attraction even harder. And if I was a person looking to start a small business in New Jersey, I would take a hard look at all the things we've talked about and say, is it a good decision? Um, so, so let me cut you off real quick and let me ask you specifically, everybody mentions regulations. We have too much regulation. We have too much regulations. We had a red tape, red tape commission before. Give me one specific example when a business comes to you and says, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to do this because of regulation that could easily be changed. I mean, we see it all the time with DEP regulations, environmental regulations that are completely counter at a state level than they are at a federal level. And then sometimes at a county level that um, you see that mostly across the board with manufacturing companies, warehousing and distribution companies that are just caught and a complete puzzle of trying to figure out what to do and what not to do. Um, and every misstep comes with severe penalties and fines with very little forgiveness factor <laughs> is made um, while maneuvering these conflicting reg regulations. So- I, I gotta cut you off. I gotta bring in the assemblymen because you're getting okay. picked on here or state government's getting picked on. Let's talk about this. And, and I know these aren't new arguments that you haven't heard. It, it, the taxes are too high. The regulations are too steep. The government's not in favor of businesses. Um, I can't believe that that's what you and, and your colleagues are saying um, because I hear the other side. So talk a little bit about the business climate and, and what can be done if you're hearing all these people talk about taxes and regulations. What can the, the assembly and the legislature and the governor do to fix this? Or does it need to be fixed? Well, I, first, I mean, you know, that, you know that, that commentary is not misplaced. It's correctly placed. It's from 30,000 feet because you asked a direct question, Tom, give me a regulation. And it, it's not a regulation. It's a family of regulations here, a family of regulations there. Kind of gets back to the legacy issue. Look, I, you know, I live in Paulsboro and I live between two oil refineries. 
So I understand environmental impact. I understand quality of water issues. Uh, notice I said water because that's how we say water uh, <laughs> in, in this part of the state. But, but, but the fact is, that, you know, these regulations have been developed over time because issues have presented themselves and we don't seem to take them away enough as, as circumstances change. And you know, I, I've been a critic of our DEP jumping out too early on some of what are called these forever chemicals in, uh, you know, that, that, that have recently been discussed. We don't have federal, federal regula regulations yet, but we have regulations in New Jersey. And it's a constant tug of war because there's an honest issue of public health and safety. And then, and then there is just what really, in a common sense way works to have the protections without going overboard. But I, I'm gonna back into the incentive stuff because Jeremy mentioned it. Uh, and, and not to, and I'm not trying to change the subject, but I want to, I want to put this into play. I've said to previous governors, at what, at, at, at a given point, when are all you, go, when are, when are you going to gather with your brother and sister wizards from Pennsylvania, Delaware, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and and stop this arms race of, of incentives, and let's have some sanity because it, you know if New Jersey competes well when it's competing on workforce and educated workforce transportation, the things we talked about. But we find ourselves in the incentive business because our neighboring states are in the incentive business. So we have to be in the incentive business. So, you know, I argue from the other side that if we, if we had a better tax environment and a better regulatory environment, that we don't have to give things away because people want to come here. But meanwhile, we have no choice but to, to we're in an arms race on this incentive stuff. So if you look at the value of the incentive program and thought about laying that against a tax rate change or, or some sort of change in that area, uh, what, you know, what would we get? Would we do better? Or are we better with a focus and center program? And the majority feeling, I don't mean a, a Democrat, Republican majority, but the majority feeling is that from the business community was we had to have another incentive program, which is what we did. So we continue in the arm race on the incentive program. Because I also asked a rhetorical question many years ago. Suppose we took our business tax rate to zero. What does that mean? You know, how long, how long does it take for that for us to become Delaware? Uh, by the way, when I talk to my colleagues in Delaware, they're talking about implementing taxes now in areas where they haven't talked about before. Uh, because of the influx of people, they now realize that the burden that they have is going to outweigh their ability to pay for it. Pennsylvania is looking at other tax increases now because their public school system is in shambles in places. So, you know, we have our issues, everybody has their issues, but I certainly like to lay down the arms race. Uh, on the incentive stuff. So that's a good point. And, and let me kick it to John, who I can tell is just dying to jump in here. And, and let me ask two questions. One, is New Jersey correct in the assumption that we are competing against Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New York for companies, or is it more North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, right? And then the second part is, do we need to, as a state, look, we're embracing gaming, we're embracing e-gaming, we're embracing e-commerce, we're embracing offshore wind. What about manufacturing? Is that something that we can still bring back or is that something that, that we can't? Does the state have to pick and choose which sectors when you're dealing with companies or some of them say, nah, the state's not good for that, it's good for this. Talk a little bit about when you talk to companies, what New Jersey is competing against and who they're competing against. New Jersey is in a global competition to attract corporate investment and jobs. We're not just competing with Delaware and Pennsylvania, but also uh, Texas and Florida and Singapore and Paris and Malaysia and Brazil. This is a global economy. And to the second part of your question, New Jersey needs to fish where the fish are. And Choose New Jersey does an excellent job targeting growth industries that make sense for us, like life sciences, last mile distribution, corporate head offices, technology related to gaming and this booming industry of animation, uh, data security, cybersecurity, telecommunications, avionics is a great uh, growth industry uh, for New Jersey. So that's how I would, I would answer that. Uh, you know, for our manufacturing projects, typically we don't consider non-right to work states. I mentioned Pratt & Whitney is one of our major aerospace clients. Their newest production facility is in North Carolina and, uh, a major win for the, for the folks there. And that right to work bill, I think, was a major reason why they chose North Carolina. All right, listen, a lot of questions coming in from the viewers. Those are great. Um, we'll get to a lot of them. I want to kick one to Jeremy because he's up in Jersey City. And that means, in theory, all of these people who were living in New York or working in New York, and we can get to that lawsuit, which New Jersey can and should win, I think. 
um, are, are thinking about working from home. They're thinking about working in Jersey City. They're work, thinking about working in Cranford. And, and quite frankly, they're, they're thinking about working in Cedar City, Utah. So it's not just a guarantee that they're going to come to New Jersey. Let's talk about the work from home dynamic, um, how it operates, how the state can benefit from this, how it can be hurt by this. Jeremy, in, I think there's a couple of apartment rentals in Jersey City that are available right now. What, who's trying to fill them? What are you seeing? Do you think that boom, that, that multifamily boom is going to continue because of this? How do you see this shaking out? Yeah, work from home has been an interesting opportunity for us particularly and for everybody, I think, in proximity to New York. But you're right. We're not as attractive as going up to the Poconos or going up to you know, upstate New York. <clears throat> but what we're seeing the opportunity is in that middle um, income folks that want more space, more value for their daughter, dollars, and more opportunities for, you know, outdoor activity, outdoor space. And so they'll come over to Jersey City or further into the state. Um, but what where the opportunity is for the state is to make sure we're providing ways for those, those folks to see it as a sustainable change. Because a lot of people are looking at uh, particularly rentals and saying, hey, this is a great way for me to come for a couple of years, then I can reassess. And if I want to go back to New York, um, I, can I can go back easily. And what we have to do is figure out how do we capture that market share and say, how do we make it a permanent choice on their behalf? Um, and I think things that we can do, things that are helpful are the federal group, which are pushing heavily for SALT to come back. That would be such a major boon uh, for us in retaining these folks uh, but also other folks have talked about regulation. And if we, we there, there's so many things that we could do around helping families be able to come to the state, easily buy a home, renovate a home, make permanent inroads here that we don't do. Because if you come to New Jersey, almost any of our municipalities, but certainly a place like Jersey City, it is so hard to figure out the process of just buying a home and renovating a home. It's so hard to figure out how to navigate the school registering a kid, getting a kid into school. You know, it, those are opportunities if we can make those easier, if we can market those assets as well. We have the, some of the best schools in the country. And, and those are things that could help families decide they want to stay here. But more important than all, really all of that is the pure economics of it. And so if we take a look at this moment and say, what are the right infrastructure choices that make it a smart economic choice for folks that were traditionally centered around or in New York to be able to come and and do and make their homes in Jersey. I think we could really capture a large population of, uh, you know, high income earners uh, with a lot of value add for the state. All right, listen, I'm going to get to other states in a second. I want to do one more question within the state. I'm going to go to Joe, who, who I just learned, like me, has five kids. God bless you for that. Um, so let's talk about housing. Right. I mean, this is this is a huge issue and it's not multifamily housing. It's not low income housing. It's not luxury housing. It's it's what some people like to call workforce housing for your quote unquote average worker, whatever that might be at any point in the state or anything to get general housing to support. We hear that all the time that that is an issue is that people cannot settle here because the housing market is which is great if they own one, but not so great if you don't is too expensive to get in here. Joe, as a small business owner in, in battling the housing issue, do you see that as a, a big detriment for other small business owners to come to New Jersey um, to start here? Yeah, um, so the, the trend pre-COVID that I was most excited about in this regard was transit-oriented development. Um, you know, transit-oriented development attracts people who are leaving New York for the first time. They want something that's walkable. Um, they, they, know they may or may not own a car. And, you know, if there's a mixture of affordable housing in there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Um, and, and what it attracts uh, are people who, you know, they're, they're kind of like living their own lives, right? They're going to brunch on the weekends, um, but they won't always be. And then they eventually get married and settle down uh, and, and they're already living in a town. And, you know, maybe they've moved to, you know, downtown Cranford and they haven't gone beyond much of Cranford's core, but, you know, that's where they start looking. And so, uh, I really, uh, I'm very excited about the future of transit-oriented development. We got to get back to transit. You know, we have to feel safe on trains, obviously. Um, 
because then those people, those same people, you know, I'm one of the few people in Cranford that's always out there saying, yes, build downtown. Uh, like, and I'm getting in fights with everybody else, but downtown is where um, housing density belongs because when those people do settle down, those are the people that join your churches, your scout troops, your, uh, you know, your PTA associations, and that's the lifeblood of every town in New Jersey. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, some things that, you know, you look at like unforced errors like Newark, right? Newark put in what, 40% affordable housing mandate? Like they, they were acting like they were already gentrified when they hadn't even started yet. Um, and so it, there are not just mistakes being made on the state level with housing, but being mistakes being made up and down uh, the state with regards to it. So, um, you know, I, the, the one thing I would say is that affordability isn't um, housing and taxes. And, you know, I, I don't think we should be dependent on any federal motion to, um, you know, stand alone. Like we should be focused on standing alone as our own state, right? Like Braveheart, William Wallace saying like, we're, we're settling for the scraps from Longshank's table. Um, when, when like, we should be getting the whole thing. We are New Jersey, we're a great state. Um, you know, nobody's got what we got. So if we could just get out of our own way, I think that affordability wouldn't even be a question here. All right, nobody's got what we got. That's a nice segue to a, the audience. What we got is 535 municipal governments. Uh, I always joke when I tell people, when they ask me where I grew up, I say, I grew up in Northern Virginia because anything within 25 miles of DC on the Virginia side is simply Northern Virginia. In New Jersey, man, Cranford and Westfield, if you tell anybody from Cranford that they're from Westfield, man, that's, that's like the, the Hatfields and the McCoys. And we have our individual towns and we love it. And that's raising the price for everything. So I'm gonna throw this out to anybody because everybody's laughing right now. Who thinks we have too many municipalities, too many local governments, too many this and that. Is that a big problem for business? Is this causing the taxation? And how does this get solved? So I will jump in here to start. Not only do we have 565 municipalities, we have 620 plus school districts um, in the state of New Jersey as well. This is, in my opinion, one of our top problems in the state of New Jersey as it comes to the affordability crisis that we're dealing with. And I completely agree with you. I mean, down here in South Jersey, we actually have um, a school district for 10 students in one school. I'm not gonna name the municipality, but it's a school district that has 10 students in one school, that is it. Why that cannot consolidate with a neighboring school makes no sense. Why their services cannot consolidate. And at the end of the day, all of these very common sense type of consolidation measures that we have seen work in Camden City and Camden County, for example, with their police departments, but on a larger scale with municipalities and a larger scale with school districts are going to have the ability to save the, the state millions, potentially billions of dollars long-term if we have courageous elected leaders that are willing to do it. Like we have seen in South Jersey with Senate President Sweeney in Gloucester County doing some things and the leaders in Camden County doing some things. So that's just initial thoughts off the top, but this is number one issue by far, I think, in, as far as our affordability crisis goes. And, and here I'm thinking South Jersey just wants to secede from the state. I didn't realize you wanted to do everything together. <laughs> Um, look, yeah, I, courageous you know, leadership. We, we've got the assemblymen. Let's go back and, and talk about this idea. Let's talk about the path to progress. This is not a new conversation. Is there anything that's happened in the last year with COVID uh, assemblymen that's going to make us think about more of these shared services as we try to come out of, of the financial difficulties that have been brought on by the pandemic? I advanced, uh, I advanced an idea internally uh, going back as it was clear this COVID issue was going to be with us for a bit. And I had said to a number of the people around me at the State House that I thought we had a, a rare opportunity to really affect change, that people would understand that uh, the structure we have in the state uh, is just, it's just too heavy. Because here, here's the one thing that happened for businesses, people like myself, uh, mortgage companies were giving forbearance, insurance companies were helping, uh, utility companies were helping to help people stretch through this. Uh, landlords weren't allowed to evict people, so renters were in place. That's a whole different topic. But all those things said, uh, with all that help that was coming, the one thing that stayed constant that was a burden was people's property taxes. I'm talking about residents. Business, you know, business can absorb property taxes, work it into their cost of goods and that sort of thing. But the property tax issue just it just it, it's simply it's simply a killer for all of us. So I said in turn to our people, we have a real opportunity now. People know there's a crisis. If we're ever going to do anything, 
it's going to mean anything to break the back of some of this. Now's the time to do it because people will know that there are things have to change. Uh, I think we've missed that opportunity in part because here's the bottom line. And we've been on, you know, been around this for a while, as many on us call it then. People in New Jersey are very clear. They want reforms. They're screaming they want reforms. They just don't want change. And it's a very difficult box to work in because we can change a lot of things. I mean, we can reform everything, but we're a representative government. So we all go home to talk to our neighbors. And when you go home and talk to your neighbors, the people of Cherry Hill do not want to go. They don't want their kids in a classroom with the people in Camden. I mean, that's just a fact of life. So, you know, these things become more difficult. We're, under, we're doing a study right now to have one school district for all of Sam, Salem County, trying to see if that is an example that will work. And during the Whitman years, you know, they talked about consolidation of government. There's some people on this call that were in that administration or around that administration. And frankly, came back to find out the smaller government was more efficient than larger government. Uh, and, and, we, and we had a requirement, passed legislation, that the school districts were supposed to consolidate. It was supposed to be, a school district had to be at least K to 12, uh, only to find out the Department of Education ignored what the legislature did. And the reason for that was, we found out later that they couldn't, they, they couldn't justify the savings. So now I don't have that in front of me to go into those details, but it gets back to the point that change is hard. People don't want change, but we have to change some things. You would never structure New Jersey the way it's structured now if you were starting today. But again, we get back to the legacy issue. You know, you're going to be stepping on someone's toes as you make as you make these movements. So school systems are a big issue. You know, do we need school systems as many as we have? The answer is no, we do not. How do you fix it? I, you know, we can do it. Uh, do you go, do you do a constitutional change? You know, constitution, I'll, I'll close on this with about change. Constitution mentions nothing about preschool, mentions nothing about preschool, but we're in the preschool business. Uh, constitution doesn't say we're supposed to do that. So, uh, but we're doing it. So, um, you know, again, uh, we want reforms. We people just aren't excited about change. You know, and it's funny because this leads to a discussion with with a friend of mine who's a mayor in a small Morris County town. It's a town that the municipality, like so many, is so small that they actually have they have a township and a borough. And most people, even living in the town, are unaware that they have two forms of government or where the dividing line is. And I said, "Gee, here's a here's a it's so obvious. Why don't you just combine it?" And she said to me, well, one of us has a huge debt burden that the other one doesn't have, and there's no way we can combine just based on that, and that goes to the legacy issue. And, and that legacy issue is going to go to, well, we didn't do it this way. John, how come so many other states have been able to set up a little better, and now they're able to pitch a little better? Talk about what other states are doing that we're not doing that we should be doing when you get into this process. Well, you know, I, I began by talking about the, the critical role of, of leadership. And New Jersey can learn from states like Nevada, for example, that has leveraged its casino industry and the unique skill sets associated with its large military presence, Nellis Air Force Base, to promote IT and cybersecurity and online app development related to online gambling. I mean, Reno and Vegas are two of the most successful IT markets in the nation today. New Jersey has so many, so much intellectual capital. You think about McGuire Air Force Base, for example, uh, and uh, you know, Fort Dix, and these unique cybersecurity skill sets that can be promoted to a national corporate audience. I see potential for a new high-tech corridor from Cherry Hill home to Lockheed Martin and, the, and that critical mass of colleges and universities in the Philadelphia market, east through the Pine Barrens and Fort Dix and McGuire, to Atlantic City, which is not just a gambling capital, but home to the FAA Technical Center. So that's the type of narrative that should be aggressively marketed to the, to the nation's business climate, just the way that Nevada is so successful doing that. Uh, so that's that's one thing, okay? It's, we call economic development, it's the stake in the sizzle. The stake is the economic policy, the, the reality of high taxes, high business costs. Yes, government has to get less expensive, more consolidations, Princeton, Princeton Borough, okay, that was a very contentious consolidation. It's now a model for other states around the country to, to do similar actions. Yes, the assemblyman's right, it's very politically contentious, but the, the sizzle is equally important and it's about promotion and it's about leadership. Are you suggesting that we shouldn't um, represent other people and brag about the fact that we have the highest corporate tax rate in, in, the, in the country? Is that something that shouldn't be on, on our brochures? Uh, what, what, the realities of COVID, companies are really engaged in traditional business climate factors today, like income tax rates. But I'll say this, 
property taxes are more of a problem for New Jersey than income tax rates. You know, when Mercedes relocated its headquarters from Bergen County to suburban Atlanta in 2015, the average relocating Mercedes executive saved fifteen thousand dollars in his property tax bill. Uh, you know, and we talk about remote working. The, the biggest reason why New Jersey hasn't absorbed more of the three hundred thousand Manhattanites that have changed their address during the pandemic is because of our high our high property tax rates. Not every uh, relocating worker from Manhattan wants to move to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, although they they did that Friends episode, right? Remember with where they offer Chandler the relocation package. You know, now Tulsa is, is giving $10,000, okay? To, but I mean, the idea that Chandler would leave Manhattan for Tulsa a decade or so ago is laughable. Today, Chandler would take the job and take the cash and he wouldn't look back. You know, and you know, New, New Jersey could get more of that, uh, but we have to address our, our, our property tax situation. You mentioned Mercedes, there's Sealed Air, there's Honeywell, there's a number of other big firms that have left for a number of reasons. Um, do we think that that will be the continuing trend? I've heard over and over again that you pay a little more, but you get a little bit more here and, and people will, will jump for that. Uh, Jeremy, you think big companies are going to stay and you think these incentives are going to bring it or is the exodus going to continue? Uh, I think that, you know, unfortunately we are going to see some big companies leave. You know, we're seeing it particularly in banking, um, in our own portfolio. Uh, but what I will tell you is as much as the taxation is the issue, and, and certainly it is, you know, uh, I think it was Joe hit a nail on the head, which is predictability. Now, I don't know if in COVID that's the real thing, but in, in general, predictability is so important in this in the regulation and the overregulation and the complexity of the regulation has really been a disincentive for folks to stay, you know, it, there's a cost. I call it, you know, I've, I've said in other interviews, there's an uncertainty tax in New Jersey, you know? Um, if I could jump in too, um, you know, you, you talk about big companies leaving and like, yeah, it's, it's very evident. My, my grand, the Nabisco factory, my grandpa worked at, you know, they're, they're going to be pulling out as well, um, but small companies as well. So Boxcar, you know, I started this in 2016. I grew it over four years to nine employees. Uh, when our revenue fell 100%, you know, we were able to replace it for six months and I kept those nine employees on until August. I couldn't help it. I had to furlough them. I've since hired two back, but I've also just hired two people in Miami. Um, and so we've got a software business. We acquire parking. You know, we partner with parking lots. We rent it out to people who need parking. And to me, this is, I am all in on New Jersey. You know, I, I built this, like I said, knowing eyes wide open how bad this state was. Um, but at this point, I need a life raft. If something happens again and, you know, New Jersey shuts down, like I, I can't go from one to zero once again. So, you know, places like Miami are easier than ever to get to. I mean, right now I can fly there for 38 bucks. I'm sure that won't always be the case. But, you know, I'm, I'm meeting with the mayor in two weeks and he's saying, yeah, come here, um, you know, and tell me your business and we'll help you make sure that as long as this makes sense for our residents, we can help you with introductions zoning and you know this is like whew, I've never felt so good right like uh, Mary Jane Canos is on this call she was the same way this summer with like groceries and driving movies just like helping us and, it, and it's so great to get that feeling as an entrepreneur because we feel like we're in, a, in an abusive relationship with our government uh, half the time so um, yeah it's, I don't think it's just big companies I think as the transaction costs to move go down you know you might get a bakery open up a location um, you know somewhere else uh, to, to diversify out of this area. All right, so let me jump in here. We've hit 10 o'clock. We like to be respectful of time. We're gonna do a, a couple more questions here and I wanna bring one up that's gonna be a great one, which is transportation and infrastructure. Um, roads, tunnels, bridges, electric vehicles, um, trying to make sure all of this works. I got Jeremy who's in the densest part of the state. I got Christina who's got all the farmlands, but both of you guys and everyone in between has a transportation issue, question or concern how much is that going to impact the state moving forward the next five or 10 years? Christina, let's start at the bottom of the state and work our way up. Give me, give me some transportation thoughts. So there's good news out of Washington with the new administration, with the Biden administration, obviously making a commitment. Um, and we'll see how this shakes out, but to infrastructure monies and projects flowing to the state. 
it is no um, surprise to anyone that South Jersey is incredibly public transportation deprived. Um, we have one rail line um, that makes its way from 30th Street Station in Philadelphia down to Atlantic City. And then we have the river line that goes along the Delaware River. Um, and that's it. Um, we need more transportation options in order to help generate more economic activity, make our employees more mobile, and then therefore widen not just economic the economic development divide that we sometimes see as a result of these transportation needs, um, but also just you know grow mo mobility throughout the entire region itself. The Glassboro Camden Rail Line is a project that has been in the works for 17 years, I believe. Some of them can probably correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I believe it's 17 years in the making that would connect the Eds and Meds Institution in Rutgers Camden to the huge development that Rowan University has done now with Inspira Hospital there. This is a project that would be incredible for the South Jersey region, the Northern part of the region specifically, because it will be connecting these two kind of institutional education um, and medical meccas in our region that is generating so much growth, so many job opportunities and so much economic development. We're finally looking like we're getting closer to that. But at the end of the day, transportation is critical. And back in 2016, when we passed the gas tax here in New Jersey, South Jersey was disproportionately impacted by that because we drive so much more than anywhere else in the state. And I know it was controversial at the time, but our chamber was the only business association to actually come out against that package um, and the renewal of the Transportation Trust Fund because we have to drive so much. So all of these infrastructure improvements are not just gonna be great for the economy, it's gonna generate jobs, it's gonna generate overall growth and you know, net wins across the board, hopefully with a new administration in DC that seems committed to these transportation infrastructure improvements, New Jersey will start to see some more success in that space. You know, I know there's been money dedicated to, to the Camden station that just came out last week. Yes. I believe. Uh, yep. But there's also a real big tunnel that they're talking about up in, up in New York, New Jersey way. Jeremy, jump in on that. Talk about how that would change life in Jersey City on the Gold Coast in your neck of the way if we could ever get that passed and set up. Is that still as big a priority as it's ever been post-COVID? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the very beginning of this conversation, we talked about proximity to New York being a huge economic driver. Anything you can do to create additional links is going to have a multiplier several times of return on investment to the state. And yes, the immediate impact will be in Jersey City, but that's a statewide economic driver. That value is, is huge. And, and, you know, what I would share is, for the most part, the people that benefit from that tunnel are the people that are driving from those other cities all the way up and into New York, right? And so, you know, the sooner we get that done, the better it is for the entire state. And, and honestly, it's not just about cars. It's about rail. It's about creating uh, bus links. Those are huge opportunities. And if we increase the capacity, there's also an, a, a net net reduced cost per user once we get up and running. Um, I also would add though, in, when we talk about the North, we are also trying to create links between the other cities up North. You know, we talk about the Hudson Bergen County light rail and creating those links so that when you're up in a city like West New York, you can easily get to say a Bayonne and do business. So you're now talking about living wherever makes most sense for your family and working wherever makes the most sense for your family. And then getting to do business with New York by just jumping right over. That's hugely important for us. We're up also, you know, when we talk about infrastructure, it's important to reflect that right now, we're seeing huge shifts and huge trends as a response to COVID. And we've got to spend some time thinking about, are those responses going to be long-term? More and more people are turning to using cars, pulling away from public transportation. And what are we going to do to build back that comfort, that uh, sense of security in public transportation? Because it is critical to our future growth and development. All right, this has been great. I want to get one more question in. I'm going to get to the assemblymen. You know, we can talk about the unemployment rate, and where we think it's going to go and how we think post-economy. But I think for the purposes of New Jersey and the future, the, the better conversation is, are we preparing the next generation for 10 years from now with our high school and our community colleges and our Votex and our colleges? 
um, the state has made a, a lot of uh, inroads towards more um, manufacturing, more apprenticeships, more using the community colleges better than ever to try to create a new workforce. Assemblyman, do you think that, that the state has the combination with the higher education or, or the education of all levels uh, correct to create that next generation of workforce? And did we lose him? I think he's just muted. We just got to get him unmuted. You mute, you can't unmute. There. Hey, yeah. Oh, he muted again. You muted again. You're still muted. It's the phrase of 2020 is you're unmuted. Yeah. There we go. There, there we go. Uh, the struggle to get unmuted. I almost, I almost lost the question. Uh, the short, uh, the, the short answer is, uh, I certainly hope so because we're we're spending a great deal of money uh, in education from top to bottom. I think there's a great deal of progress been made of how we've married uh, our community colleges into our high schools and into, into relationships with four-year universities to cut down on the cost of the degree in the end. Uh, but I also have great concern through this COVID issue of loss of time in classroom for kids. Uh, and uh, it, it may be a long time before we really understand the true impact of what's happened over this last year, and especially having these kids out of class in elementary schools and, and high schools for that matter. So uh, I think there's, there's some uncertainty as to where we are at the moment, uh, but in large part, I think there's a real focus by the state apparatus top to bottom on, uh, on how we better prepare people because, and by the way, it's changing so quickly now. Uh, those on the call best understand it. Uh, the demand of, of an education is not what it was 30 years ago. You know, people went to school and then went and drove a truck. Well, we still need truck drivers, of course. But, uh, you know, as we try to figure out how to prepare people, uh, you know, it's a moving target constantly because uh, the demands are changing. So, uh, but um, I want to say this. I don't know that we can spend any more money than we're spending. Uh, the question is, are we getting the result that we have to get? And I think that I think it's, it's a very fluid moving target. So the answer is everyone's paying attention. And uh, I think New Jersey's doing it as well as anyone else, uh, maybe better than most. But uh, it, it's very challenging. You know, it was a throwaway line, but boy, we need truck drivers. And, and that was an industry that we were hurting before this e-commerce explosion. Um, that is certainly a great need for the state and around the country. All right. It's 1010. Again, we're respectful of your time. You have to get back to your day job, so to speak. So since the assemblyman is unmuted, I'm going to start with him right now. We're going to give everybody one final. We talked about a lightning round, one response. You know, the, the subject of the day is how can New Jersey win going forward? Are we positioned there? Give us one final thought that you'd like to leave the audience with. I would say to everybody that, that, that uh, I, I will say personally that I am very an optimistic person by nature. Uh, we can do anything that we choose to do as a group if people decide they want to do it. And that's get back to my point about change. So there's very significant people on this panel. There's very significant people on this call. Uh, you know, on, on this program we're doing. So, you know, New Jersey's government will deliver what New Jersey's people demanded to deliver. So you want something changed, raise your voice, and, uh, and it's just going to take that kind of effort. And uh, I'll close with this. You know, Governor Cody's probably not remembered for a lot of things, but, he, but he, when we were struggling to come up with a different uh, tagline for New Jersey, you know, Governor Kane had New Jersey and New Perfect together, which was really strong. And I think Governor Cody said it best when he said uh, our new tagline should be New Jersey. You got a problem with that? <laughs> so the point is uh, we, 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 have to, we have to accentuate the positive, lean on our strengths, be nimble enough to change and recognize that if you're going to survive, you have to change. And that's hard for government to do and it's hard for people to do. So we can do anything uh, if people are willing to do it. Christina, I turn to you. Well, that's a nice segue, actually, Assemblyman, because I my final thought on this is just that, you know, no one wants to change the narrative of New Jersey being bad for business more than New Jersey's business people. Um, but they do need strong partner in government in order to make that change a reality. And you, the Assemblyman knows this because we've joked about this many times in the past. You know, the business community gets a bad rap for always complaining, right? We're always complaining about the policies that are in place and what can we do about it? Well, what can we do without partners in government? So 
I, do, I am also optimistic like the assemblyman, but at the end of the day, a true partnership between business and government at the very top of the state can work together to change that narrative. Unfortunately, we really haven't had that partnership over the past few years, but I'm optimistic that hopefully we can see that in the future. John Boyd, you're up. Well, thanks for having me on this great panel this morning. Final thought, I think that COVID has radically changed every impact of our society and our economy. There's a sense of if not now, then when? Uh, what, what could, could things get better, okay? And we address problems related to excessive taxation, the idea that government is too costly. That said, I am optimistic. And I, I will say that I expect a major project in Newark this year, a global head office project. Newark has been on the radar screen for a number of exciting projects and development activity in the wake of their making Amazon's top 20 list. Uh, a lot of their social impact branding and marketing is paying off. Cost savings in Newark are enormous. Class A office space in Newark, half of what it costs in Manhattan, 50% of what it is in Chicago, and 30% less costly than Seattle. So that's something to look forward to in the new year. Joe, I turn to you. Um, just big picture. Uh, if you've read Hirschman's Exit Voice and Loyalty, right? Uh, consumers and in our case, companies and residents, we have three choices when we live in a system. Uh, loyalty, just participate in it. That's what most of us do. 99% of our lives, we just participate in the systems around us. Voice, which is when we oppose uh, parts of that system. Um, we, you know, we voice our opposition. We say, this is unfair. This is wrong. It creates bad incentives. Um, but, you know, Short, short of like violent protest or something like that, voice uh, leads to exit, right? So these are the three choices that everybody looks at right now. Uh, loyalty to the system, voice in opposition to it. You're seeing a lot of people starting to say that. Um, but at the end of the day, voice does not continue forever. It leads to exit. There are no, you know, socialism only works. It will never works, but it only works with exit controls, strict exit controls. We have none, right? So it, the transaction cost of going from New Jersey to Florida uh, has fallen by 90% in the last 40 years. Uh, it's almost nothing. Um, so it's easy to say, like, you know, you might win the argument with people. You might say, hey, you know, we're going to try to raise these taxes and, you know, increase these regulations and create a, you know, more equitable, whatever the tagline is to pass the, you know, the, the tough thing that day. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you can win all these arguments and still lose because people will leave. Um, and And that's not, a very pyrrhic victory. Well, we're thankful that everybody here stayed around. So we're going to close it up with Jeremy. Uh, take us home. Uh, I would say that we have all benefited from all the th things that Jersey has to offer. And we have to remember that as we go forward. And I would suggest to everybody that we start thinking of ways that we can all help each other win. Because if any one of us do better, we all do better. And we got to take that to the level of these different cities right now. There is a zero sum analysis that is all too often brought to play in New Jersey. And we've got to re erase that paradigm. We've got to start looking for synergies and opportunities to lift each other up because that's how the state as a whole wins. And that's going to mean streamlining processes, streamlining certain opportunities, but remembering that it's a balance. And at the end of the day, it's that balance that we got to look for. We don't need huge winners and huge losers in, a, in, in our state. What we need is everybody to do better. And with that, I would say to everybody, have a great day. And thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, look, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the audience. But most of all, I want to thank Regina for putting this together. This was a, a, a terrific panel, very enlightening, uh, a great topic. We could talk for hours, um, but I'm going to give you the final word. So thank you for having me and thanks for setting this up. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. It was uh, terrifically uh, well managed and a great contribution from all the panelists. So thank you. Um, I just want to close with my, I guess, my lightning round um, and actually building upon, uh, you know, a lot of the great statements that were made. But Assemblyman, I'll give you the credit, uh, you know, in terms of saying that, you know, New Jersey, if you started from the beginning, you wouldn't have constructed it this way. It's going to require a lot of change, a lot of leadership and much partnership. And that came through in many, many comments. And uh, I think, again, uh, you know, the statements that were made about needing to change and wanting to change are two different things. And when you have a uh, partner, you know, as the assemblyman was offering to be, you know, in the assembly, 
that what they need to hear is what do we need to change and hear the voices, right, from both the business community, you know, the residents. And one of the roles GSI uh, does play and will continue to play is to try to bring together, you know, uh, sound policy founded, fa with foundation in, um, you know, good facts and a desire to really help New Jersey win. So as we did in our last forum, uh, after this, we will consolidate some of the uh, content of the forum, but also offer some uh, policy advice, not endorsed by any panelist, um, but really being the GSI place, but really at the foundation from this group. So with that, I'll close. Uh, thank everybody again for joining us, as well as the panelists. And uh, we'll see you next time on our next uh, virtual forum. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks so.